These are classic wooden power boats. They're primarily constructed of mahogany and heavy on the chrome accents. Most of them are 60, 80, even 100 years old. Built by hand, board by board, by true craftsmen. You don't own this kind of boat because you need to, or because you want to. You own this kind of boat because you have to. And that's what mahogany and chrome is all about. With endless miles of scenic shoreline, a vibrant cultural heritage, exceptional architecture, and authentic adventure opportunities everywhere you look, the Thousand Islands region of New York may be one of the best kept secrets in waterfront destinations. The archipelago of more than 1,800 islands scattered along the border of New York and Canada, where Lake Ontario feeds the St. Lawrence River, offers sightseeing, shopping, sport fishing, world-class dining, the arts, and year-round outdoor recreation. And one of the crown jewels of the Thousand Islands, Bolt Castle, stands as a storybook icon of Gilded Age opulence. Started in 1900 and abandoned after tragedy struck the Bolt family in 1904, today the restored Rhineland-style castle infuses the Thousand Islands with a sense of mystique and charm that you won't find anywhere else in America. Be sure to check out our links and show notes to learn more about Bolt Castle. Bolt Castle and its massive yacht house are both accessible by boat, and you can tour both structures for a very reasonable fee. Of course, we had to stop by and check out the restored yacht house, an epic reminder of the importance of boats to the nautical culture of the Thousand Islands. Carrie Jobson, operations manager at the Castle and Yacht House, gave us the inside story. Carrie, give me kind of the history of the Bolt Yacht House. Okay, so uh, it was constructed by George Bolt. He um, is a Prussian immigrant who came over to the U.S. when he was about 13 and he found his wealth in New York City. He later became the proprietor of the Waldorf Astoria. In 1899, he constructed the Yacht House in less than a year. Um, and he had it for um, all of his boats throughout his life. Now, you gotta have a lot of boats because this place is massive. How many boats did yeah. he have? So over the course of his life, he had about 70 boats, ranging from his race boats to his steam yachts to some work boats. The one thing I really notice here, I say it's big, but it's so tall. The doors are huge. What what was he bringing in here that needed this much size? So those were his steam yachts that he entertained on. It's actually a sleeve in the roof where it would come down over the steam yacht so that they could fire it up inside. Oh, they could do it inside yes. so it didn't, didn't uh, pollute everything. Correct. Or oh, yes. very, very cool. So is this structure just for boats? So actually the caretaker's living quarters is an exhibit that is adjacent to this room. And then above us, there are several floors, um, would be where some of the other crew members would have stayed. So how long have you been here? About four years. Okay, so you've had enough time to kind of take it all in, soak it all in. What's your favorite part? Well, the, the structure alone is super awesome. It is pretty magnificent. Um, and then the boats in it, the antique boats. We have some of his original boats and we also display some from the Antique Boat Museum. And we have the steam yacht Kestrel on display here as well. And then you've got the caretaker's living quarters right adjacent to this room. So it is the river culture within. I say it a lot on this show, but it really is, these places are just time machines. Like you could just go back and you do get a sense of that, of the feel of what it, kind of what it must have been like yes. to be in those days. Yes. The luxury and the, I mean, behind us would have been where they worked on the boats. Um, so you've got where they maintain them and where they have the fun on them, from racing to just entertaining. So Carrie, what's the deal with rich people in the Gilded Age and boats? So they, you know, would come up here from the city, you know, and they would entertain captains of industry to politicians. So between the racing, kind of showing off their money, and also entertaining on the steam yachts. They had chefs on board their steam yachts. So yes, whatever they could do to kind of just show their wealth and entertain up here in the Thousand Islands, they took advantage of it. And how did the Bolt family, how did they fit into that hierarchy of that whole thing? So he, he is a true uh, American rags to riches story. As a Prussian immigrant coming over and he built his wealth and then came up here um, and just kind of slowed down with the river life. 
If it's not too much trouble, I would love to see the caretaker's quarters. Absolutely. Come with me. Okay. The local terrain dictates that the Thousand Islands are best experienced from a boat, and there are tons of sightseeing excursions available. But for a truly authentic Thousand Islands experience, you can't take just any boat. It's got to be a mahogany and chrome classic, preferably something along the lines of this 1926 custom runabout that's considered boat royalty in a land of castles. This is Vagabond King. Vagabond King is owned by Thousand Islands native Drew McNally, who suggested the Bolt Yacht House would be the perfect place to meet. Well, here it is, the Vagabond King. How are you, Drew? Hi, Tyler. How are you? Really good, good really good. Permission to come aboard, sir? Please do. Fantastic. You just Slide over here. yourself in the front right. there. Will do. Perfect. Good. Well, that was easier than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> oh. I like the sound of that. Get it going. <laughs> Give me kind of the history on the on, on this baby. So the boat was built in 1926 at Hutchinson's, which is here in Alex Bay. Uh, it was it was a, a a design boat uh, for the DeWert boys. Their father was a publishing executive, and for their 16th birthday, he had two of these boats commissioned. And these were gifts for 16-year-old boys? <laughs> they were, they were. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and uh, apparently, they raced them up and down. At the time, they were two of the faster boats on the river, and... Well, because they were driven by 16-year-old boys, right? Exactly, and they, they you know, this boat, tops out. Uh, it had a little bit faster engine at the time in it, but it probably topped out around 38, maybe 40 miles an hour. And apparently they would race anyone who wanted to, to race them. The boats have always been together, which has been really interesting. The, the, they've either had the same owner or they've been in the same location. And I'm the fourth owner of this boat. So Drew, when did you know that you had to have the king, the vagabond king? Well, the Vagabond King set, sat in, uh, in at St. Lawrence Restoration's uh, warehouse for several years, uh, listed for sale, and it needed some work done on it. And it caught my eye, and we've, I've grown up around wooden boats, and we own wooden boats, but I've not owned a, uh, a triple cockpit runabout. And I know, that I always wanted a bigger one because if you ask anyone here on the river it's got to be 26 feet and above to really ride the water real well right. here on the river otherwise you find yourselves uh, on a poor weather day or, or a high windy day it's, it just it doesn't ride quite well. You're kind of fighting it. Yeah the water's big and wind picks up and you need some some good oomph to get it going yeah. and and it, it's a it's a well-built boat it, it really is it's it cuts through the water it's it's like a Cadillac so why do these classic wooden boats in the Thousand Islands seem to go together so well in the 1890s the Thousand Islands was the playground of, of what was then the, the the millionaires and billionaires at the time and they love their boats, just like they do today. And they acquired the latest and greatest boats over that period of time, and they had races. They really fostered the, the development of the wooden boat and the speed boat of the times. And then, and then it, obviously it fell on harder times when the Depression hit in the, in the 30s. It died down, but people kept their boats. And for that reason, that, that it it had become part of the culture up here yeah. and, and the aura. You know what I mean? It, Ab absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, just look around. You're surrounded by water. I mean, it just it makes sense that you want to have to to eclipse the beauty that you've got, the natural beauty out here. You almost need the, this kind of beauty, you know, to, right. to match it. It's 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 so amazing. Let's uh, let's open her up and see what she can do. Let's do it. 
Get your hats on tight, let's go. So you think a boat like Vagabond King is out of your reach? Think again. When Mahogany and Chrome returns, we'll take you to a place on the river where anybody can boat like royalty, at least for a day. ACBS, the Antique and Classic Boat Society, is the largest society in the world dedicated to the preservation and enjoyment of classic boats. Membership in ACBS provides access to a welcoming community and a broad range of valuable resources. For a small annual membership fee, ACBS members get a subscription to Rudder Magazine, exclusive online access to valuable databases, historical records, and high-quality boat restoration and maintenance videos and workshops, a strong social media presence, discounts on rental cars, services, boat insurance, and more, and membership in an international community of classic boating enthusiasts. Each year, ACBS chapters organize more than 100 classic boat shows, boating events, and gatherings throughout North America. There is truly something for everyone. Take the first step into classic boating by joining ACBS today at acbs.org. If you're anything like me, when you think of museum, you probably think of untouchable exhibits protected by velvet ropes, maybe some grumpy security guards, a clunky app to guide you around, and oh yeah, don't forget to visit the gift shop on your way out. Well, the next stop on our tour of the Thousand Islands blows the traditional museum experience out of the water with exhibits like this. Miss Thousand Islands 3, a 30-foot triple cockpit hackercraft runabout. She's just one of several mahogany boats making up the in-water fleet of the Antique Boat Museum in Clayton, New York. For a small additional charge to the museum's general admission, anyone can board her for a 45-minute cruise on the St. Lawrence River. The in-water fleet is even handicap accessible. Cruising the river in a 30-foot triple cockpit hacker is a great way to get a feel for the boating history and architectural heritage of the Thousand Islands and the majesty of the St. Lawrence. The hands-on boating experience doesn't stop at the docks of the Antique Boat Museum. In fact, that's just where it starts, on this four and a half acre, 10 building shrine to America's rich boating heritage. Besides buildings full of fascinating exhibits and rare boats, Antique Boat Museum also operates an in-house shop which is staffed by a master boatwright, Michael Gorman. Michael is responsible for overseeing most of the repairs and restorations to the museum's 320 boats, all of which have been donated. He also leads Antique Boat Museum's range of intensive hands-on classes called the Boatyards Programs. Michael, I'm told this is where you gotta go if you wanna get something fixed, built, or in this case, chiseled. Yeah, yeah chiseled, right. uh, wrecked out, destroyed, whatever you wanna call it oh, okay. in this case. Uh, what are you working on right now? Uh, this is uh, this is a reproduction that we had here in the shop. It was built here about 25 years ago. And so the planking went a little bad on it, got some bacteria, some growth in it, and started uh, rotting it out a little bit. Okay. So we're gonna put a new bottom on this boat. And the first thing you gotta do when you put a new one on is you gotta take the old one off. Okay. So more the merrier on stuff okay. like this. Okay, what do, you, what do I need? What do you need? Uh, well, there's a hammer over there. You gotta have your safety glasses. Okay. The insurance company says so. <laughs> and then there's a couple chisels over there, whatever one makes you happy. Uh, this one makes me happy. Okay, now, before you pop in here and destroy the world, a okay. couple things to know. When we're uh, chiseling wood, we're gonna always put the uh, the angled part of the chisel against the wood. Okay. What that does is it lets us move up and down and control how much we're taking. Got it. If you go with the flat, it's just gonna dive on you and we're gonna wreck out all the stuff we're trying to preserve on the boat. Okay. All right? So it's a little bit of a fussy work, for right. sure. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put that bevel side down. And uh, we're not trying to, you know, beat some money out of this thing. We're just tapping the chisel along to okay. get the wood off, all right? Right. My tools are sharp, so that'll help. Yeah. All right, so we're just gonna cruise along and take them off. And you can see as I start to, I start to pull down a little bit, it pops the pieces off. Yeah. Just like that. Okay. Now you see how it's got a little flake there, it's yeah. still attached. Just go ahead and take and just give it a little tap. 
Okay. And that'll break it right free. Beauty. Just like that. All right. Give it a whirl. I will. We're gonna go this way. Okay. All right, and then a little bit of tip tap here. Flip it away, yeah. My so. God, you're an old pro. There you go, that's <laughs> what I wanna hear. Um, I mean, obviously education is a big, a big deal at the museum. Is that that's part of this as well? Is just like is learning how to do these kinds of things? Yeah, well, we do these projects. We have volunteers come in and work on this with us. Um, we also like to double dip on these projects and use them for classes. So people can come in and uh, we'll have different classes on different facets of boat building, yeah. either getting ready to build a boat or different restoration techniques. Um, they can come in and get confidence, uh, so when they go home, they feel they feel comfortable working on their own stuff. Well, you're making me feel confident mm -hmm. about it. I'm, I'm there sorry, you I'm go. Gonna, I'm going to keep. I'm let gonna, it fly. I'm going to let her fly. Keep going here. How long you been doing this for? Uh, I've been restoring boats for museums for about 15 years. And why? Do you, why? Why? Why do you do it? Why, what, <laughs> what? What got? What gets know. somebody That's, to do it? It's a great question, man. Uh, probably I've stayed in like the nonprofit museum sector because I enjoy history. I like preserving things, and there's something really fun about figuring out a way someone else did something and replicating that, mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to make my own my own mark on things. That's that's fun for me. Do you do much woodworking, or I am I taking a big risk? You're here? taking a huge risk. I mean, we're talking Titanic territory here with, oh, yeah? with me being well, on here. It's all about the confidence and, and having fun. What's your favorite part about what you do here? Is it the, is it the education? Is, is it just I being around I do like the sister? interaction. You know, sometimes I call this place the zoo. We got two <laughs> doors. We got a walkway, yeah. and it's nonstop visitors through here, questions all day long, and yeah. I love that. Yeah. I could sit and talk. I mean, I do have to get something done, but of course. Uh, I love the interaction and chatting and Everyone's got a good wooden boat story they come through and tell you about, yeah. and their grandfather or whatever. Um, I love that aspect of it. And there's not a lot of places for a person who likes to restore boats uh, that gets a 100% diet of really cool wooden boats to work on. Yeah. And we're sort of like ghost writers, like no one knows we were there. We're really supposed to the, reflect the original builder's intent. Yeah. and uh, the, the way that they, they wanted their craft, and that's uh, a lot of fun for me. And then on the flip side of that is, there's really no power tool that's gonna do the job that we were just doing. It's a mallet and a chisel. Yeah. It's the same tools that have been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. We use them because they work, and they're, they're the best way to go about it. So Michael, honestly, I can take it. Um, do I have a future in boat restoring, or should I, uh, should I stay in television? No, I think you did pretty good, man. I don't know if I'd charge for it yet, but, <laughs> but you did pretty good. You know, a lot of chiseling goes into a boat like this, obviously, but this is, yep. a, this is small in comparison to some of the boats there. But Correct. that behemoth over there, how much chiseling you got to do on that thing? Uh, it's a fair bit. It's a fair bit. Okay. You want to take a look at it? I do, actually, yeah. All right. So give me the details on Footloose and... Is it Fancy Free? Fancy Free, which is on the other side. Okay. So Footloose and Fancy Free, she is just called Footloose most of the time. That's yeah. how we affectionately call her. Uh, this is a 1937 Fitzgerald and Lee, uh, which is just up the road. Fitzgerald and Lee built boats uh, in Alexandria Bay. So it's special. What are you guys doing to it? We're not doing much to it. Uh, this has got a lot of preservation into it rather than tearing it apart and rebuilding it. Uh, the patina's all been uh, preserved on it. We didn't even re-chrome a lot of things. The major work that's happening on this boat is its original engine is getting rebuilt from a shell. Okay. All new components. And then in the fall, over the next uh, two, three months, all the systems are gonna be put back into this boat. Okay. We didn't strip it down, stain it, and varnish it to make it look new. It was kept the way it is to tell the story of all its li the lives it's lived. And it lived in Florida for a little while, so it's a little bit blonder than you would think on a runabout. So when you're all said and done with Footloose and Fancy Free, what happens to her? Uh, so she's in our collection. Uh, she'll be cared for and stored inside on her trailer. Um, and then a couple times a year, uh, she'll go to a boat show, do some flybys, show it off. Um, it's a lot of effort and uh, time has gone into her, so we gotta, we gotta let, 
show it off a little bit. And get her on the water, right? Absolutely, yeah. yep. She won't live in the water like a lot of our ride boats in the yacht house that we take people out on, but uh, she'll be, people will be able to experience her doing flybys at shows and stuff. And one thing I want to know is when, when you work on a boat like this and then you see it out on the water, I mean, do you, are you sentimental that way where you see that boat and you're like, I, I put a lot of heart and soul into that or is it is it just on to the next one? Uh, I'll put it this way. I know the guy that's got countless hours rebuilding the engine is going to be have a big smile when he sees it ripping by the dock. Okay, okay, cool. Well, thanks, man. Yep. Appreciate it. Well, There's lots more antique boat museum just ahead. Plus, we sample the wares at a wood boat watering hole, drop in on one of our sponsors, pick up some boat buying tips from an expert, and check out some tiny wood boats built by a huge talent. Antique and classic boat lovers have a home in America's heartland. The Heartland Classics chapter of ACBS warmly welcomes members from Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas. An active chapter with an award-winning magazine and multiple yearly events across the wonderful waters of this region. Vintage boating fun is always just a short drive away. Heartland Classics is a proud sponsor of Mahogany & Chrome. Join today at heartlandclassics.org. While Antique Boat Museum is all about providing those authentic boating experiences, it's also a world-class museum housing thousands of rare artifacts and collections that you won't see anywhere else. Executive Director Rebecca Hopfinger showed us the highlights. Rebecca, I'm told that right here in the small craft complex is, is really the place you need to go if you really want to be at ground zero for learning the history of boating here in the uh, Thousand Islands. Well, it's certainly a place to start to learn about small craft and the non-powered boats, so those that are operated under human power or wind power. So we have in this gallery our St. Lawrence River Skiff. So what's unique about the St. Lawrence Skiff? Well, the St. Lawrence Skiff was designed to really work well on the mighty St. Lawrence Rivers, which can be quite rough. So it's a double-ended boat with uh, layup straight construction, which handles the waters quite well. And at the turn of the century, the Gilded Age here in the Thousand Islands, these boats were used by fishing guides as well as islanders. But this is how you would go back and forth between the islands, and the guides would take you out on a St. Lawrence skiff for a fishing trip. Now, can that still happen out here? Can people experience that sort of thing? Well, we're very fortunate to have a working livery here at the museum, so at no extra charge, people can come in during the livery hours and actually try their hand at a St. Lawrence rowing skiff and, and learn to row. You should see for yourself and take a, a skiff out. I would like to. It, it sounds like like that's one of the things I, I like about your, your facility here is that there is that, that immersion, that chance to get out and actually do the things, try the things, because they're still here. Absolutely. So here at the museum, it's about the history coming to life. And having that experiential component is so critical to our mission. But the museum experience is more than just you know manual boats and rowing and that sort of thing. It, it really traces the entire, the entire history of, of boating in this area. We have everything in our diverse collection from a dugout canoe to a two-story, 106-foot houseboat built in the early 1900s, straight up through to a Sweet 16 Evinrude. So we are into fiberglass a bit, too. Of course, I couldn't turn down the chance to try my hand at rowing a St. Lawrence skiff at the museum skiff livery. All right, Molly, let's go skiffing. Museum educator Molly Voth was brave enough to give me a lesson. So your motion's gonna be up, pull back towards you, push down, down and away. And away, okay. Yeah. Keep me posted if uh, I I'll run keep into you posted. If you wanna turn, you're just gonna use one. So you're gonna hold one still and just stay motion with that one hand. There you go. Like oh, a pro. And I gotta do, I gotta get my arm up and over. There you go. There. I did some canoeing when I was younger, so that's kind of. Kind of. Gets somewhere. you in the right. It's right still down. Yeah, you're still good. Okay, no, good. You're I'm, still good. We're going. No, we're up. I'm up, right? I'm up at up. the top. Pull back towards you. Up, back towards me. Push down. Push down. Push down. There, you go. there we go. <laughs> I lost it for a second. Oh, I'm doing it the wrong way. You're trying. Yeah, it's this one that you're going to push. This one goes forward. This one goes this forward. One this one goes back. back. There, there we go. go. Whew. Tell you one thing, it's a workout. <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah, we're getting a little close to the. The safety boat. This is, you know what, it's, it's, it is a fun experience. 
it's, I think it's something that people would, would really, really enjoy. And I'm glad you put it out there because it is, it's one of those things where you can't do this probably anywhere else and, uh, and have someone as lovely as yourself <laughs> kind of make it easy to kind of make mistakes and, and learn from it. So I really appreciate it, Molly. Of course. Thanks of course. so much. Rebecca, this space has a much different feel than what we just experienced. And you call it the National Motor Boat Show. Mm -hmm. Why? The exhibition was developed to sort of replicate the early trade shows for these boat manufacturers that were popular in the 1900s. And so much like today's modern trade show, the manufacturers would take their wares and their latest models and display them, and hopefully the buyers would be there. For the person who doesn't know a ton about antique boats and that sort of thing, but is interested in the history of it. This seems like a fantastic space to begin with, to learn more about it. A absolutely. I mean, so many people recognize, at least recognize, the name Chris Craft. But there's Garwoods and Elkos and Hackers and Faye and Bowen and any number of other manufacturers that are represented in this exhibit. And so it does give someone that sort of introductory to the world of boat manufacturers. These are such beautiful pieces of art that you have in here. <laughs> you can only imagine that the people that owned these had to have some level of wealth. As you can imagine, uh, these as cutting edge pieces, if you will, or technology, it was those in the upper echelon of society that were owning large motor vessels like these. But what's fun about this particular exhibition hall is we have an outboard motor exhibit up on the mezzanine level and I can take people through the museum and, you know, they connect to certain boats, um, but almost everybody connects to an outboard motor because Uncle Joe had one or Grandpa had one. And so to find that kind of connection as you visit is really what we we very much enjoy having our visitors feel that connection to the world of freshwater recreational boating. What I love about this space is it's just, it's got this immersive kind of feel. There's no velvet rope, there's no don't touch the Mona Lisa. You really want people to get kind of get hands-on, for lack of a better term. Absolutely, so, you know, for instance, uh, Alexandra, which is an Elko cruiser, I mean, that's a wonderful boat for people that can actually step on to see the cabin, experience what it's like to stand at the helm. It's almost like being able to, to, to step back in time, is it not? Like just to, to step on one of those boats and, and, and to feel the leather, to, to feel the, the wood underneath your feet. Or if these planks could talk, so to speak, what stories these boats would tell. Whether it's an airplane or a motorcycle or an automobile, seems like the minute you drop an engine in something, you want to see how fast it can go. And boats are, are just the same, right? Absolutely. So this exhibition is called Quest for Speed, and it really celebrates everything that goes fast, particularly on the water, of course. And the other really fun piece of this exhibition is the look at the mechanicals, you know. So what are those advances with the engines in the early years and that quest for speed, too? The thing about the boat racers is that I don't know if they got the recognition they deserve. Because there are guys like, like Gar Wood that, I, I mean, they were as well known back in the day as Babe Ruth. Well, I think it's always a little bit about competition, right? And so Gar Wood, for instance, he held the patent on what today is the modern dump truck, and that gave him the disposable income to really pursue that speed. And I think that that's a big part of it, you know, that competitive edge and that, you know, your boat can go faster than someone else's. So it's not just about speed, there's also a, a real innovation element to the whole thing. Absolutely, I think those who were competing really wanted to push the envelope and, and use the t latest technology available, but also pursue new technology so they could go faster. So you don't have to be a huge fan of powerboat racing or anything like that to enjoy the Quest for Speed exhibit. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, this exhibit, right from the building itself with the timber frame construction. Which is beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, to the objects displayed in here just make it outstanding. I mean, there's 
the various materials from the brass and the copper, all of that to look at, and then of course the lines of the bow. I mean, the beautiful curves, the tumble homes, there's so much to take in in this exhibition. Everybody can appreciate beautiful things, and this room is full of them. In addition to world-class wooden boats, the Thousand Islands is full of local flavor. World-famous Thousand Island dressing and traditional shore dinners top the list. But when we come back, I'll show you the perfect place to drop anchor after a day of boating on the St. Lawrence. If you can't quite get your fill of classic wood boats at the Antique Boat Museum, there's a great little joint up the street that really puts the local in New York local flavor, making Wood Boat Brewery our next port of call. Standing here at the stern of the, uh, of the bar that is made out of an ex-boat with uh, Mike, Mike from uh, Wood Boat Brewery. So why, why the wood boat theme for the brewery? Well, uh, I've always made spirits and, and, and beer, and and as, as the uh, trend, the, the craft beer trend started, I thought we should, that Clayton should have a brewery. We're right across from the, the, one of the nicest antique boat museums in the country. You know, we're, we're looking at the water and we can see the boats and they're sleek and smooth, like our beers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we just thought it kind of fit. Uh, we tied it, tied it in with them and uh, it helps them, helps us. So we decided that uh, we'd give it a shot and it, it, it took off. So it's pretty clear from what's in front of me that your specialty is the beer. And some of them are nautically themed as well, right? Yeah. Tell me about them. Well, so, you know, like again, we're tying it in with the Boat Museum and, and the St. Lawrence River. Uh, so like the Pardon Me, which is a very uh, known, well-known boat in, at the Boat Museum. Um, we have a Channel Marker, you know, as, like the Channel Markers on the, the river. We have the Lime and Ale after the Lime and Boats. We have Bow Light off the bow of the boat, you yeah. know. Um, you know, we just try to keep it somewhat nautical. What about your ingredients? Is there something special that sets you guys apart? All of our ingredients come from New York State. I find that there's no sense in going any, anywhere else because we have wonderful New York State products. So all of my products come from New York. Okay, so what I have in front of me here is technically a beer, but not exactly. The makings of, yes? We have some crystal malt on the bottom, and we have some chocolate malt in the middle. And then this is pale malt on top. Okay. And we have hops, which again are all locally sourced, all local farms. Oops. Even our uh, ingredients in the beers, other than the malt and the hops, are fruits, everything. We use either organic or locally sourced. And clearly the response has been fantastic to the Wood Boat Brewery because downstairs you got a full restaurant that's just bumping, you got the wood fire burning with pizzas. Tell me about those pizzas. Are those, are, are those locally sourced and locally made, everything? All of our pizzas are, you know, hand tossed and uh, again, with great ingredients. We don't open cans and dump things out. We prepare fresh stuff every day. Um, and we try, you know, like I say, everything's quality and it, it, I think people can see it in the end result. These boats that are now bars, were they actually water worthy or were they beyond repair? If they were beyond repair, I wouldn't have used a, a, a good boat. So we found these and, and uh, we made them work. What do you want people to take away from their time at the Wood Boat Brewery? They've been out all day, they come in here. What, what do you want them to experience? Well, they come in, they can uh, bring their family, they can sit out on the front porch, they can watch the boat, the river, have a fresh glass of beer, a, maybe a pizza, uh, some sandwiches, uh, just a really nice, casual experience. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you taking the time to tell me all about the Wood Boat Brewery, and uh, I'm really getting sick of having to stare at these. Can I actually have a sip of one? I think you okay, should. Okay, thank you, sir. Or two. Just a couple. Oh, that's good. Mm. That's good, too. Now's probably a good time to stop Googling how to buy an antique boat, because I've got the answer for you right after the break. Hopefully by now you're dreaming of owning a classic vintage runabout, or maybe casting a line or retrieving some birds on your own mahogany guideboat. But in this age of fiberglass and gel coat, how do you find your ideal mahogany and chrome watercraft? 
Well, we found your one-stop shop for all kinds of wood and fiberglass classics. It's called Antique Boat America, and it's also located at the epicenter of New York wood boat country, Clayton. I dropped by and I kicked a few tires with the Vice President of Operations, Mark Krizanowski. Hey, Mark. Hey, how you doing? Good, man. Nice to meet you. Good Welcome. to meet you. I'm Tyler. Um, I, whatever it costs, I'm buying. There Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about Antique Boat America. What, what's your story? What's well, it all about? As you can see by the sea of mahogany behind us, we're a broker for Antique and Classic Boats. Yeah. Uh, so our company was founded in 2003 uh, by Peter Mellon. And uh, Peter was new to the hobby at that time found that it was difficult to start the search. There was no single place to look for antique and classic boats. Often you would find a boat that you wanted to buy, drive several hours, and it wasn't as represented. So this was his solution uh, to a place where you can shop for a variety of different boats, come see, come touch, and see what fits. So this is a good place to come, compare, contrast, and see a variety all in one stop. What if somebody is looking for something very specific. Is, is that something that Antique Boat America can handle? Yes, so our showroom is really a backdrop for what we do as a whole. Uh, the large majority of our transactions are from a distance, from one state to another, sourcing a boat, you know, a specific type of boat for somebody, using our resources uh, that we have to find, you know, a very rare specific boat for uh, collector purposes, for example. Well, let's go see some boats then. Let's go take a look. All right. So uh, this is what you're talking about when you when you say entry level. Absolutely, this is exactly at the quintessential classic Chris Craft, 17 feet, 1947 Chris Craft Deluxe runabout, um, under 20 feet, under thirty thousand dollars. The perfect entry level boat. And. Who's the primary customer for these kinds of boats? Usually a first time boat buyer, somebody with a younger family, uh, maybe already one boat in the boathouse looking for something a little bit different. You know, the after five cocktail boat, you know, you can entertain a few people on it. Um, you know, the after five boat, calm waters, and uh, go out for a evening cruise. Not necessarily for the hitting the, the hard rivers or that sort of thing. Yep, though. that's typically what the other boat is for, and this is for pure enjoyment. So someone's had their entry level boat for a couple of years, they want to move up, where do they go? So this is the fifty dollars to $80,000 range. This is generally a second or a third boat for somebody. This is maybe somebody who's growing their collection, for example, looking for something a little bit more particular, uh, something to bring to shows, have it judged, or just a little bit more space for family and friends. So you want to take these boats out on the water, you want to get them out there, but you also kind of want to show them off too, right? Yep, absolutely. So this is the category of boat that you can bring to a judged event, uh, you know, maybe take home some hardware, or feel proud about your purchase. Uh, it's also the kind of boat that you would consider as a family legacy to heirloom item to pass down to your children and, and your grandchildren further down the line. Gotcha. Now, take me to the top, take me to the big stuff. Let's go look at the big iron. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mark, we are definitely not in Kansas anymore because this is a step up. This is it. This is the pinnacle. This is the upper crust. This is what we would categorize as the tier one collector quality classic. This is a boat that is extremely rare, has provenance, has history. It's ready to go to a show and win. Now, who, who's the buyer for this kind of thing? This is usually somebody who's been collecting for a number of years, is searching for a very specific boat to round out a collection. This is the missing link uh, that completes the collection and really makes it something special. And is that where Antique Boat America comes in? Like you guys, you guys can go out and you can find these things. Yep, this is typically a situation somebody calls up and says, hey, this is what's missing from my, from my collection. This is what I'm looking for. This is what needs to slot in and really finalize, finalize the backdrop of my collection. And how does that work for you guys? How do you, where do you start? Where does the detective work begin? This is you know, a network of people that we've accumulated over the years, contacts that we found. Fantastic boats, you know, they pop up over the years, sometimes they disappear. We have to remember where they are to find them later on. Well, I see the old red ensign on the back, so we know it's from Canada. That's but right. Give me some details on this boat. This is a 1929 Ditchburn Viking built in Muskoka, Ontario. Ditchburn is a uh, number one custom builder. They were very active through the 20s and 1930s, starting in the early 1900s, building small skiffs, rowboats, livery boats, and then moving into high-end, um, you know, one-of-one production for many, many of their builds. 
Uh, so this is a Viking model, one of 20 built between 1927 and 1929, one of seven left in the world. Wow. This boat was originally commissioned by the Toronto Harbour Police Department. This was a uh, pursuit and patrol boat, so high speed. So what was high speed then? 42 miles an hour in 1929, which is pretty unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to ask you just a very simple question. How does somebody come in and buy a boat? The process usually starts, you know, somebody comes in, maybe they have an idea what they're looking for, they look at option A, option B, option C, maybe they rely on us to give them a few options. Following that, we hone in on a boat, we put in a purchase offer, 10% down, and typically a boat will go through inspections at that stage, so you get your marine survey done, you do a water test, and uh, usually it takes a few weeks for that process to happen, and you move forward to closing on the boat, and you go boating. So you want to buy a classic boat, on price, where do you start? Where do you end with Antique Boat America? Yeah, so something um, we always try to express when somebody walks through our door, we have everything from $5,000 to $500,000. And we think that, you know, having enough options in that range, we can com accommodate pretty much anybody. What's some advice for people that are trying to buy a boat? Well, we think, you know, starting with us at Antique Boat America is a great place to start. Um, outside of that, Join the Antique and Classic Boat Society. There's a chapter in every state, every region. You're going to find like-minded people that share the same passion, and you're going to get an influx of information right off the bat. Mark, it's been super informative. I, I think I've, I've picked up a lot of information. Those at home as well, uh, if they want to get into the, the, the boating world, this is a great place to start, Antique Boat America. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you being here. Thanks. Of course, buying a classic boat is the obvious way to get involved in the hobby, but there's an even simpler solution. And Mahogany and Chrome's got it when we come back. Lots of people think getting involved in classic boating is hard or expensive or I don't know anybody. But getting involved is actually very easy. It's affordable and you don't even need to own a boat to have a blast on the water. Start by visiting our sponsor, the Antique and Classic Boat Society, which is exactly what we did at the 58th Annual Antique Boat Museum's Boat Show. Laura. For those of us that know the ACBS, love the ACBS, because we know all about it, but for those who don't know anything about the ACBS, just kind of give me the broad strokes. Our members get the connection to the vintage boating world. They get um, information from the ACBS office on the history of their boats, but they also really get a whole social network of other boat enthusiasts to reach out to and get information and also gather together for social events and boat shows like this. You mentioned vintage boats. That, that includes not just these fabulous wood boats, but, but more than that, right? The original antique boats were all wooden boats, but we go back 25 years, so it now incorporates wood, uh, metal, whether aluminum or steel boats, fiberglass, so it covers all types of makes and models. So who is your average member of ECBS? The hobbyists and enthusiasts, but also everybody. We have a, a large portion who, um, they've been in the hobby, they grew up as boaters, but we have folks who are now just getting into it for the first time and we have folks who aren't even boat owners. Um, so it is a social club that they just love the history of boats, yeah. and so they want to participate at our regional events. Do you have to own a boat to be a member of ACBS? No, you do not. All you have to do is appreciate them. You do not have to be an owner, and we welcome everybody. Our chapters want more people because they are looking for volunteers at shows like this. They, we need lots of other folks, so we welcome anyone uh, to the club. So it's not just a club, it's actually a, a social thing, isn't it? Yes, it's very much a social thing. Our chapters, not only do they organize the local boat shows, but they also normally organize a couple of cruises every year uh, for their members to participate together. If you don't own a boat, they'll assign you with another member to go on the cruise. They'll do dinners and um, lectures and different educational programs throughout the whole year. So you don't have to be purely a boat owner to join in on that fun stuff. What I'm hearing is that even if you don't own a boat, ACBS is a great place to, to start. It's like kind of a ground zero if you want to get into the hobby. Yes, we're a great resource to let you know where to buy your boat. Um, 
who to talk to and get into it from the, the start and take you through years and years of ownership. We tell all of our folks, you know, if there's a new member, call them for a cup of coffee, whether you pick them up by, by car or by boat, it's a great <laughs> way to introduce them to the area. How is ACBS getting young people involved? Because I know that's really important to get them interested early. Yes, so ACBS, we have a junior membership program. Uh, starting, we have members as young as six years old and we encourage them, we actually keep that junior membership up through 26 years of age. Um, so because we want to encourage the younger folks coming out of college, just getting started in their careers to join uh, and have it at a reduced rate. And the membership is a great tool for all members of all ages. Laura, thanks so much for having us and for being a sponsor of Mahogany and Crumb. It means so much to us to bring this community to the people. We really do appreciate it. Tyler, thank you very much. We love you at ACBS. We are so supportive of it and we think it's a wonderful thing for the vintage boat hobby. Thank you. It is with an incredible honor that I'm standing here with the president. Not the president of the United States, but in fact the president of the Thousand Island chapter of the well, ACBS. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Randy, yeah. it's good to have you here. I'm, it's good to be here. As the president of the Thousand Islands chapter here at ACBS, you are more than qualified to answer this question. And that is, what is so special about being a member of the ACBS? To become a member in the ACBS, it's, it's the camaraderie of, of uh, all, the, all your peers and, and the folks that are around us. The community comes together, um, you become a family. It's more than just boats, isn't it? It really is about people coming together, about community. Yes, yes, it's definitely social. Um, we, we like to try to get together at least once a month and more if that's possible. Uh, we'll, we'll take a cruise on the, during the week, uh, get everybody out, and um, we've had you know, 25 boats cruising up and down the river here um, on a weekday. It makes, it makes it pretty interesting. I think there's a, a big misconception out there that uh, to be a member of some kind of a boat club, like the ACBS, that you have to have some fabulous boat, but that's not true, is it? No, it's not true at all. I joined the ACBS, didn't have a boat. All of a sudden, complete strangers are family. That's the way it is. I got hooked. You talked about strangers coming together and becoming family. Can you elaborate on that? I don't know how that comes about, but you know, a lot of times you go into a, a strange setting and you don't know what to expect. Well, if you come to the ACBS function, any one of them, doesn't matter where it is in the United States, it's family. Well, Mr. President, if, you, if you've got a <laughs> young people sitting out there watching and they're, they're thinking about joining, what would you say? What would you say to them? I would, I would invite them to one of our functions to start with and make sure that they understand that they don't have to have a boat and if they do have a boat, it doesn't have to be a show quality boat. It just has to be a user, something that's friendly, fun to get into, and just um, go out and enjoy yourself. The best boating there is is here on St. Lawrence River. So um, there's just so many places to go. Uh, and it's just breathtaking. Well, it sounds like a really great organization to be a part of. And I am really grateful for you taking the time, Randy. Well, thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. Thanks for coming. Once you take the plunge and get that classic boat, you gotta show it off. And we're gonna show you how it's done at one of America's oldest and best boat shows. It's Boat Show Week here in Clayton, New York, marking the 58th annual Antique Boat Museum Boat Show. The energy level's definitely picking up as antique boats and vendors pour in from all over the country, even from across the river in Canada. Daniel, you know, when we look at these great antique boats, they're so beautiful, we're mesmerized by their, their, their looks and angles and that type of thing, but the guts are right. on the inside, and nobody gets to see them unless you pop them open. Right. This is what's inside some of these boats. And as far as I understand it, this is the engine that's gonna go into Footloose and Fancy Free? Well, this is an identical uh, version of the engine. It was a production engine, so they made, we don't know the exact n a number, but they made them for 20 years. So this is an identical uh, engine that's gonna go into the Footloose. Yeah, so Tell me what we've got here. This is a 1951 Scripps 302 V12 marine engine. 894 cubic inch V12, liquid cooled, twin ignition, 
It makes 350 horsepower at 2,800 RPM. They sound like they mean business too, right? Yes, yes yeah. they do. And they develop a tremendous amount of horsepower at low RPM, a lot of torque. So they'll push a runabout like that about 50 miles an hour. Yes. And now is the, 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 the golden moment where I get to hear this thing run. So let's sure. roll it. Let's roll it. Sure. All right, so where, where am I going to put this? You're going to connect that to the positive. All right, got it. That's where you're exciting the coils. Okay. And push that button and okay. I'll the throttle. I'm excited. Here we go. One, two, three. Hey Wow, I mean that thing, that is a machine that moves you. It's a, you know, like you, you hear an engine, that kind of thing, but right. I could feel it. Like yeah. it actually shook you. 900 cubic inches. You know? <laughs> That's unbelievable. The largest American gas engine is a you know, 454, so it's double that. Oh my so gosh. It's a lot of power, a it's lot of a, torque. A ton of power. And how long have you been doing, working on these things? About 45 years. So just a little bit of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you've got a little <laughs> bit of experience on these things. Well, this is an unrestored engine. I mean, this is an actual original engine from the factory in this condition. So it's amazing how well it runs. It's been around for 80 years. I was going to say, do you ever, are you ever shocked at the dependability that, that no. of these machines? No. They're actually, you know, beautifully engineered. We build a lot of great stuff in the United States, you know. It's a shame. I think today we're kind of losing our edge, but back in these days, Nothing was better. But as long as we have people like yourself that are keeping these keep things it alive, alive, you know, right? we, because we, that's alive. something, and that's something that we're, everyone in this community is trying to do with right. the boats, whether it's the engines or whatever. Exactly. It is, exactly. It's, it is a really important part about. of American history. That's what this whole museum's all about is preserving this stuff, you know. And we're really, generations. we're really grateful that you do it. Thanks, right. Daniel. Thank you. Nice Thanks to so meet much. You guys. My right. pleasure. Take care. Like everything at Antique Boat Museum, the boat show is all about the classic boating experience. And the fun part is, you never know what you're going to encounter. Well, you're looking at three John Hacker designs. These are models that are produced of existing boats. They were unique commissions back when they were built. Uh, this boat was 1931, this boat 1939, and pardon me, 1947. The boats are still maintained in pristine condition and I have built models that are as accurately reflecting these boats as I can make. The boats are entirely scratch built. In some cases, I've been able to obtain original plans. In other cases, I've had to work from measurements that I've taken uh, or composites of information that I've been able to pull together, but they're entirely scratch built. The wood is the structure that I have created to replicate the original boat and all of the hardware and the metal and the fittings are all individually crafted for these boats that you cannot purchase any of this in, of these uh, fittings or the hardware it's all individually made. in many cases that actually involves taking a chunk of brass and a hand file and whittling it down three years ago I visited the museum I took photos and measurements of every fitting. We printed the, those items in a castable resin, which we were able to use with a lost wax casting process. So those printed parts became the pattern for the cast parts, which we cast in bronze. Then those finished elements were finished. I had to smooth them off and file them and then polish them. And then I did the plating and then install them on the model. All these models are radio controlled, so I actually can run them in the water. And that's one of the things I enjoy. It's, it's not that I run them a lot, but it, the idea that they actually perform, putting the motor in there so that the model does what the initial, the original design was designed to do, it, it kind of makes, the, makes it original and a, and a meaningful project to me. I really have a good time at boat shows because of the people that I run into. The general public that attend these shows seem to have an appreciation for craftsmanship and the beauty of these designs. John Hacker was an amazing artist and I have enjoyed recreating his designs and I never get tired of looking at them. Pardon me as a an amazing boat and it's really special to me for several reasons. Yesterday morning I was given the opportunity to ride on Pardon Me and it was a thrill. Uh, the uh, director of the museum 
was very gracious in allowing me to be one of the few folks who had a ride on Pardon Me in recognition of the three years of labor and the fact that I brought the boat from Michigan so that people could see it. And what a, what a thrill. It's an experience I will never forget. The highlight of the Antique Boat Show at the Antique Boat Museum is probably the boat parade on Sunday morning. Where else are you going to see and hear this many elite classic power boats underway on the scenic waters of New York's Thousand Islands? Antique Boat Museum generously invited Mahogany and Chrome to ride on John Hacker's ultimate manifestation of the Mahogany runabout, Pardon Me. Life is always better on a wooden boat. If you like what you saw, make sure you subscribe and hit the like button. We'll keep bringing you more classic boat adventures. I'm Ty Harcott, and we'll see you next time on Mahogany and Chrome. Let's go.